The Return of the Time Machine Undoubtedly, the most perfect science fiction gem is H.G. Wells' world-famous novel, The Time Machine. This marvelous story of the inventor of the time-traveling machine and his trip in it to the far future is a classic that has thrilled the world in books and films since the turn of the century, but there had never been a known sequel to it. Now such a sequel has been found and Daw Books is proud to present its first appearance in English. Here, then, is the rest of the story of Wells' time traveler, of his further visits to the future, and of the time machine's desperate entanglement with the past. Like the original classic, it is a clever, ironic, and always fascinating novel, which contains thought-provoking theories of time and society, as well as being a science fiction adventure hard to put down. So, I recently attended a lecture which purported to solve the mystery of the blurring, this slide into strangeness and unusual happenings which has occupied so many of these videos over the past few months. The speaker started from the premise that we are living within a simulated reality. He noted the mathematical near certainty that if simulated reality can eventually be accomplished through our technologies, then we must already be living in such a simulation. He talked about the major religions and how each of them have confirmed in their own way that we are living in a simulation. So, for example, for Buddhists and some Hindus, this simulated reality is recognized as illusion, and the ultimate goal is simply to escape it. In the Abrahamic religions, on the other hand, we are playing a game in which our choices are scored, and when we're done playing, we move on to another, theoretically more real, reality. In those cases where religions depict afterlives, those afterlives could be other levels of the same game, determined by our choices on previous levels. The speaker talked about shamanic and meditative practices, how each provide methods to see through this simulation, like seeing through a computer game into the code. None of the lecture to this point was very new to me. I've read or thought most of these same insights, and I'll admit I'm convinced of the outlines of this explanation, although I've never concerned myself with the details. This is where science fiction usually comes in, most famously recently in the movie series The Matrix. But of course, The Matrix doesn't even attempt to explore the possibilities. Instead, it treats the simulation merely as a background, functionally the same as any other background for any other retelling of the monomyth, whether Star Wars or the Fellowship of the Ring or Harry Potter. The speaker explained that he had constructed a device and over several decades of research, including trial and some particularly egregious errors, he could now reliably remove himself from this reality. Not only that, others could use this same device, and their experiences provided the proof of his success, because they each independently discovered a reality outside our own, although here was a problem. They did not each discover the same over-reality or er-reality, which you'd think they would in a Matrix-like universe. Instead, the experiences of individuals varied, but not so much that each was entirely unique. For example, some people woke up, as one might expect, from an extended sleep in suspension capsules to take a shift in the command center or upon safe docking of their ship after a long voyage across the inner reaches of the solar system. Some shared simulations with others, as in Philip K. Dick's Maze of Death. Others woke up to find themselves completely other than themselves, as dreaming fungoids on planets with unpronounceable names, or as chemical spills on an ocean's surface, flashing in and out of sentience as the sun broke intermittently through the clouds. Many could remember having taken what they thought might have been wrong turns in the last bardo, as they journeyed from one death to another, where each death was to wake up again from a history of wrong decisions. Some found themselves in fields of flowers, some on red-hot planes of fire, which seemed to work much like start menus or maybe leveling menus for games. One person returned to say that she knew she was a bit of space debris, something launched endless eons ago by a long-extinct civilization to explore the neighborhood of their solar system. Her solar panels and hydrogen scoop fed her endless supplies of energy, and so she continued forever. But her mind had broken many, many millions of years before, and, so saying, she simply popped out of existence, as if she had never been there. 
although her family now misses her. The speaker told these stories and many others using an old-fashioned slide projector. I don't know how he could possibly have obtained the images, which were, at least in some cases, quite harrowing, especially as some seemed to cause the space around me to shift and warp, and it felt that my own safe and secure sense of this now was sometimes ready to collapse. At the end of the lecture, the speaker did not take questions, although I knew many in the audience were fairly bursting to grill him. In fact, he left quite abruptly. He simply closed up the projector in its suitcase-like container and walked off the stage. It took a full minute for us to realize he had really gone. And then we broke into a murmur of confusion, which grew louder and louder and nearly turned ugly. We could not discover where he had gone. We could not even remember who had scheduled his appearance. Now this led to some confusion, which led me to think for a moment. Why was I even at this lecture? I looked down at the pajamas I was wearing. They were the very same I had gone to bed in the night before. Aha, I thought, and so I woke up from my nightly simulation.